The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you're listening from. This is Janina, and I'm going to talk to you about working with list and JSON variables today. If you have any questions, please don't refrain from asking them. My colleague Justin is going to try to answer all of them as fast as possible. And if there's anything especially interesting, he's going to ask me during the training. So let us start. First of all, oh wait, let me just get my webcam out of the way. Perfect. Okay, what are we going to talk about today? First of all, what is a list variable? Many of you have probably not worked with a list before. It is a bit tricky sometimes. How do I use a list variable in widget designer and what do I need to pay attention to? There's a couple of things that you need to know about it if you want to use them efficiently and correctly and don't run into any unforeseeable problems. One little explanation. The difference between value and reference type variables. This comes in very important when you start programming a lot with lists and also with JSON. Next thing, what is JSON? Uh, many people are talking about it. You see it everywhere, but what is it? And how do I use it in Widget Designer? It's pretty simple, you will see. And I'm also going to show you a very small basic example project, uh, how I can manage a little JSON database. Okay, let us commence. What is a list variable? In former versions of Widget Designer, a list was called array. Now it's called a list because that's easier and shorter. Um, a list can contain any kind of value. So you can have objects in it, you can have um, strings in it, integers, doubles, bools, other lists, everything you want. The values inside of a list are stored as object type. I'm going to talk about that later because that's also a little tricky and you will also encounter it in uh, a couple of different locations in Widget Designer where you need to pay attention to object types. And there is, in principle, no size limitation. So you can add as many items to a list as you want. But if you ever encounter the question, How, what is my size limitation? You're probably doing something wrong. You should never run into something like this. How to use a list in Widget Designer? Let us move to Widget Designer to show you that live and in person. OK. Whoops. So, let us start with a couple of normal variables. I'm going to use local variables just to show you off. Um, okay, first an integer like 42 and maybe a double, which is 3.14 pi, my favorite double. Then we have a string, let's say, hello. And another variable, which is going to be a bool, and it's going to be true. So these you should already know, <clears throat> and they are clear. We have two number types. We have one, well, character string, where you can have numbers and letters and any kind of symbol that you want, and a boolean, which is true or false. The list type is a bit different. As I said, you can put as many values in it as you like. Those values are delimited by square brackets. So let's say I have a list with four elements, just the numbers one, two, three, four. Elements are separated. Ooh, I forgot to enlarge my scripting. There you go, sorry. <clears throat> so I have one, two, three, four. That's four different elements, and those are delimited by a comma symbol when you're writing it like this. Okay. Now I have my list full of values. What else can I do? I can also say, debug message list, just to see what it looks like. Test, and there we go, one, two, three, four. Okay, if we use not predefined values like one, two, three, four, but something like this. Mm, 
you can see that I can also add any kind of variable in there. String and boo. And if I take a look at that as well, you can see it took the values from my predefined variables. Great. Of course, I can also enter something like fader value, for example, or maybe a label text or anything like that. We are going to work with the numbers because they are a bit easier to understand. <clears throat> How am I going to address those elements? So let's say I have stored a couple of values in my list. How do I retrieve a value? Let's take a look at that. debug message list and now I need the index of the element I want to address and I put it again in square brackets. So if I say I want my item number one, let's test that, it gives me a two. Why does it give me a two? It's because we are going to need the index over here and the index starts always with zero. So the first element is index zero. And this is actually my index number one, two, three. <clears throat> That's it. So if I want the first element, I need to enter a zero. Ah, there we go. That's my number one. How am I going to set the values? Well, the exact same, exact same way, actually. I take my list. I use the brackets and if I want to address the first element and maybe not have a one but the expression first I can address it like this so index number one is going to be not the number one but first let's take a look at that and there we go first and first perfect same thing we can also do with the last element which is index number three, remember, and say last. Test, and there we go, first and last. That is pretty easy. Okay, let me comment that out for now. And let's take a look at uh, list member. So you have already learned about members. So a string, for example, can have replaced members or all kinds of string analysis. A double can be rounded, a bool can be negated. Of course, the list also has a couple of members available. So if I place a dot behind the list, you can see a few of those things. For example, average, that one comes in handy when you are having a list full with numerical values like the one I have now, one, two, three, four. That gives you the average of all the elements in between, which is going to be, wait, 4 plus 2 is 7, plus 2 is 9, plus 1 is 10, and the average should be 2.5. Let's see, 2.5, there you go. Also, extremely valuable is the count member. When you are working a bit more with lists, you are going to need that one a lot. <clears throat> it gives you the number of elements in the list, so 4 in this case. What you will also need is if you, for example, want to display the, uh, the content of a list in a label. Let me show that to you first. So if you want to say label, what was it, 47 dot text equals list. So what you might expect is to have the one, two, three, four in the label. Let's see what happens. Nope, that does not work because the label text is not compatible to the list type. So what you have to do is you have to join the elements. <clears throat> Let me show you what that does. I am taking a separator, like for example, a comma. <clears throat> and when I execute that test, you can see that the label now shows one, two, three, four. If I use a different join operator, like maybe a minus symbol, you got that one. So keep in mind when you're working with a list and you want to display them as text, that is not possible without joining the list. Or you take a single list element and show that as text. That is possible as well. <clears throat> okay. 
Um, there is one more way to work with lists, not only the members. There's a couple of global commands that are available for using in list. Um, let's remove that again <clears throat> and use that one. They all start with the array. This is unfortunately a heritage from the older versions of Widget Designer when we still had arrays instead of lists. So the commands are still all called the array. There's a couple of commands you can use, like the append command. I use that a lot. List, which it just appends some element that I choose in the back. Let's see what happens. Yes, it appends a five to my list. The same thing you can have with prepend, which will prepend an element in the front, like for example, a zero. Check that. Perfect. A couple of other commands are, for example, for filling a list. For example, get list view row. If you have a list view, you can just take every single cell in a row and write that in a list. You can also, for example, remove the first element or the last element. You can resize it. There's not many, but there's a few very handy commands. Keep those in mind when you're working with lists. <clears throat> okay. Now, okay, let's say we want to have this part over here. And we want to have the last part over here as well. But we have done some things with our list before. We do not maybe know how large our list is going to be after we did some things with them at the moment. There's uh, six symbols in it, so maybe we do not know which symbol it's going to be or which element. So what you can do is within the index field, you can still use normal widget scripting. So you can say list.count and minus one, because keep in mind, count gives you the amount of elements that is six over here, right? But the index of your last element is five. So that's what the minus one comes from. And if we check that out, there we go. First element, last element. This you will need uh, when you are working with for loops, for example, that go over each list element. Then you will have to create a for loop from index zero to list count minus one. We're going to have an example for that later. Okay. Wait a moment. The first half is done. Okay, great. Let's take a look back at the presentation. Now I'm going to talk about the object type that I have announced before. Imagine the situation. You have an integer. The integer is 42 and you want to write it in a list. Let's transfer that into a bit value. And yes, Douglas Adams actually took a number that looks really cool in binary. He's a genius, or was. Okay, we are taking now the 42 and say we have a predefined list and my element number one is supposed to be my integer 42. That's over there in the middle. Great, stored in the list, maybe I'll put a bit around. We do not know what's going to happen with that list, but at some point of time, we might want to retrieve that value. With, for example, this command, I have a new local variable, call it x, and I want it to be my list item number one, so 42. We know there's a 42 inside, which a designer knows there's a 42 inside, but what is that 42, which a designer does not know that? Is it going to be an integer? Uh, it, it looks a bit like it, but it can also be a double. It can even be a string, and that is the problem. We can always take a 42, we can calculate things with it, we can multiply. If it's a string, we can append it somewhere. But as soon as we want to address a member of that 42, like maybe it's a double and I want to round it, maybe it's a string and I want to replace something with it, we do not know what type it is supposed to be. So we need to define that with this simple little syntax. <clears throat> 
I have to convert my list element, my object type, to an integer. Let's take a look at how that looks in Widget Designer and what that means. Open that one again and make it a bit larger. Okay, so I'm still keeping the list I have defined before. And let's say my, I have a new variable that I call x, like the one before equals list zero. Okay, we know that the zero element contains the word first because we have said it here. Widget designer does not know that. So what happens when I try to check something like using the contains member of the strings? I want to check if my element contains the letters F, I, R, those. <clears throat> That's a pretty easy thing. So I take my variable X and place a dot behind because I expect the string members to pop up. I know it's a string, right? But which it doesn't. So all I have over here are the conversion types. And if you take a look at the type, so this one returns the type of variable it tells me it's an object. If I say, for example, uh, str dot type, it tells me that it's a string. <clears throat> so if I want to use the string member of the string that I know is in there, I need to do something like this, x dot to string. So I'm converting my x values to a string and then I can access the string members like contains FIR. And let's try to do that. It's true because it obviously contains FIR. That is one way to handle this. What you can also do is something like this. Whatever this returns is going to be an object, but I can place another dot behind it and directly convert it to a string. What happens then is my x is already a string. It was initialized as a string, so whatever goes in there, we know it's going to be a string. And also, let's say something else. Does it contain x, y, z? No, it doesn't. <clears throat> there is one more place where you are going to encounter object types, which is when you're using macros with input parameters. Whatever you have as input parameter is going to be of object type. And of course, you can just use the value, like the 42, that we can use as a means for calculation. But if you want to use members of that, you need to convert it into a proper member first. <coughs> proper type, sorry. OK, that is the object thingy. And one more thing I would like to show you is the decodes bytes member. For that, I have prepared a little list. Sorry, wait a moment, I'm copy pasting. Okay, something like this. <clears throat> when you are dealing with TCP, UDP or serial messages, you should know that all those protocols are sending byte values. So it's always eight bits encoding a certain kind of data. Sometimes it's really just flags that are being set. Sometimes it is um, <clears throat> data that is sent and those are arriving as bytes. Widget can take those bytes and put them in a list. When you're, for example, using the action script node or the TCP script node, you can retrieve the incoming package as a list of bytes. What do those bytes mean? Let us check that out. You have a nice little shortcut to the ASCII syntax, opening on the other window, of course. And there you have a table with the decimal, the hexadecimal, and well, the, the letter representation of it. <clears throat> we have decimal values. A byte is, of course, 0 to 255. That is the range of values you can have. So if we take, for example, the 76, which is our first byte, 
and we take a look what it is over here. That is an uppercase L. And this is how you can encode text in bytes. So now you do not want to take this list and check every single number in this list over here and to find out what it means. That's what we got, a little helper over here. And it is called decode bytes. So this is going to do the same thing as we would do manually. Take this number, check in the list what representation it has and give that back, just in easier and quicker. Let's see what happens. Test. Lists are great. That's exactly what I wrote in there. Yay. <laughs> and the exact other thing you can also do the other way around. For example, I have a string, hello world, and you can convert that one into list bytes if you want to. Let's test that. There you go. That's the byte list representing the string hello world. That's just a cool little thing you should know. Okay, let's close that one for now. Apart from the um, from the action script node and TCP and UDP messages you can receive, you will also need list variables when you're dealing with the watch folder input node. That one can um, give you a list back containing all the file names and file paths of a certain watch folder. <clears throat> okay, next topic. Value and reference. This is going to be really tough, but the reason I'm going to go through this is um, you're going to need to know about this in only very specific cases. And I could just tell you, oh, when you're doing that copy thingy, then you should use this member and everything is fine. But I would like you to understand the reason why you have to use it so you can have a deeper understanding at what point you might do something wrong in future when you encounter problems. So two different types of well, data types. First, the value types. Those are any type that has a fixed length, like the integer, for example. An integer always has a length of 32-bit. It doesn't matter if you have uh, a zero in it or a five million or a minus seven billion two hundred thousand. It's always 32-bit and nothing else. If the number you want to enter in an integer exceeds this limit of 32-bit, that's a pretty big number, and it's not going to fit in there. Same goes for double, which has 64 bits, and a boolean, which has, well, actually one bit, but memory reference is always in bytes, so it's at least one byte. Color, which is four byte values, RGB and alpha channel. The date, which well, always contains the same kind of information. And in a way, string. Of course, you might think, wait, uh, strings are not always the same length. That is true. A string is, in the back end, a reference type. But in the front end, the one you are seeing in widget design, it is handled as a value type. So you don't need to worry about strings being reference types. Just imagine it is a value type. OK, and the remaining types are lists and JSON, of course. And there's one more little thing, widgets. Yes, you can do something like my var x equals fader one. Then you have a variable that is linked to a widget. It is in some scenarios uh, useful to do that. And if you do do that, you should keep in mind that this is also a reference type. I have prepared a little presentation to explain what exactly that means. OK, let me zoom in a little so I can see what's going on here. And also open my little test window. So I can script a bit. OK, so what I'm going to show you now is more of a principle. If there's any real programmers amongst you, Please be patient. This is just something for, for showing the principle. This is not 100% accurate. I know that. But I would like to be everyone to understand what is going on here. So I have to keep it a bit more simple. 
what we have over here is a representation, a representation of a physical memory. So your, your RAM basically. There are cells in it. In your physical memory, it is always one bit or let's say one byte. <clears throat> and all of those little transistors are having a address. I have used a list view over here and the addresses are, well, as you can see, maybe C1 or G10, <clears throat> something like this. So I'm going to work with those addresses. In the real computer languages, like when you're doing C++ or something like that, the addresses look slightly different, but they are still addresses. <clears throat> okay, what happens when I initialize a variable? Let's say I have an integer variable called intvar. And I set it equal 13. Also enlarge that a bit. Okay. What happens when I do that? It initializes it and it reserves or allocates, which is the correct terminology here, one specific space in the memory. Whenever you are initializing a variable, you are creating it for the very first time, this is what happens. The variable is always fixed to its location. The location cannot change. <clears throat> This is what initializing means, reserving a very specific piece of the memory for exactly this variable. So if I now change the variable to 42 maybe. Oh, sorry, I forgot a step. <laughs> okay, that comes late. The same goes for double variables. Double var equals 3.14. We all know P. Um, <clears throat> the same goes for a double value. As you can see, this one reserves a bit more space than my integer because it naturally does need more space. Remember, integer is 32 bits and a double value has 64. So this one is longer. The location associated to my double variable now is G5, which is the first cell. Whenever I have something that is longer than one of those things, I have to use consecutive cells because I'm always referencing to only the first one, like this one. I know it's a double value, it's going to take two cells. So yeah, great. There we are. Now comes the changing. If I change it to 42, then the value in my reserved cell is also going to change to 42. Easy doing. Let's change that back. And what happens if I do something like this? I create another integer var. I call it other int and I set it to int var. So what's going to happen now is I'm creating a new variable. I am allocating or reserving a new piece of memory over here, h1. And I set it to the same value that's in that cell. So both are 13. If I now change the ver first variable value, so my blue one, it is still going to stay the exact same. So the blue one changes. The, the turquoise one does not change because, of course, they are not linked. I just copied the 13 from here over there and everything is nice. It would be very easy if that was the same case for everything. Okay, let us take a look at what happens when we create a list variable. Like something over here, the one we had before, one, two, three. So we take that list var equals one, two, three, four. <clears throat> what we think happens is I am associating my list var with field number E14, which is the first field over here. So far, so good. But what happens if I want to do something like this and add an element to my list? <clears throat> That's going to be a bit tricky because, well, what it's going to try to do is adding the 5 over here. But there already is a value. You see that? The 620 over here. Something like this is a reason for an application crash. You have no idea which application is already using that space. 
And if you're trying to write on a reserved cell or read from a cell that has a different value in it from another application, this is going to crash. This is the reason <clears throat> for crashes with the, the error message, something like memory allocation failed or something like that. <clears throat> it is possible to program something like this. If you're a good programmer, you don't. <clears throat> So, what are we going to do now with our problem? We still want to add the 5 over here. And obviously we can in Widget Designer. So, this is where we start using the reference type. <clears throat> okay, what we are doing as a reference type is, we are allocating one little space over here, number D4, no wait, D15, sorry. And what we're doing there is we are not writing the value in it, but we are writing a pointer in it, so an address. The value in this one, in my little, uh, my little location variable, is E14, which is the start of my value. Okay, that uh, doesn't seem too bad. Let's see what happens when we actually do want to add something, something like this, when we want to change our array. We are creating a new variable in a space where we have enough memory left. And we are changing the address of the pointer, which is really smart because the size of the, the address field it will not change. The size of the address field is always well, sufficient to contain the address, and that's all. And my list variable is connected only to this location, but the value inside it can change. So I am now pointing on my green field and not on the red anymore. And of course, the red one is destroyed afterwards. So we're going from <clears throat> pointing to the red one to pointing to the green one. And this is what happens in your memory every single time you are changing your list. The old one is destroyed and it is copied and will amend it at a place where there's still some free space and what changes is the pointer. Now you meet, might want to ask, what do I need that for? Because obviously when I'm writing something like this, I, I don't notice any of that. The problem comes in when you try some, to do something like this. <clears throat> of our other list equals list var. Okay, let me show you what happens with a little debug message. So the first one is list var, and it's going to be my list var, and the second one is my other var, and displaying Oops, other list over here. Sorry. Okay. Okay, let's check what happens. <clears throat> okay, first of all, that looks pretty good. I have my first variable, 1, 2, 3, 4, and I have my second variable, also 1, 2, 3, 4. Perfect. What happens if I execute this command and I add the number 5 to my first list? Let's check out what happens. Test. Ooh, that looks different. That one is okay. I want to have my 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But the second one, my second list is also 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's not what I have expected. I didn't want to have the 5 there. I only added it to the first one. Why is that happening? And it's small again, sorry. <clears throat> Why is that happening? Why do I have the five over here where, where it definitely did not touch my other list? <clears throat> so what happens when you are executing this script over here? When you are setting one list equal to another list, this is what happens. <clears throat> you are initializing a new address field, like we knew from before, that's over here. And what you are doing with the equal sign is you are setting it equal to 
the address field of the previous one. So what's happening now is this one, the yellow one, my second list is pointing to the orange one, which is pointing on that one. That is the value I want to have. But as soon as I am changing that, my yellow one is still pointing on the orange one, and the orange one is now pointing on the green one. This is why the value changes. <clears throat> Whatever you are doing to your first variable, it's going to be linked to the second one because you are having that pointer connection. You are not pointing on something real, you are pointing on another pointer, and that creates problems. So what you have to do then is really easy. You have to use the copy member, something like this. <clears throat> this uses um, the value you had before, copies it to another place in your memory, and creates a new pointer on that one. So what we did now is we are not referencing that one to my old list. We are creating a completely new variable somewhere else in my memory and pointing on that one. And this is why you need to use the copy member whenever you want to set one list equal to another list or equal to the value of another one. And keep in mind, you also have to do that with JSONs because those are also a reference type, right? I hope that was more or less understandable. If you didn't get it quite, don't worry about it. Just start working with lists and someday you will encounter an issue like that. This video is of course going to be posted in YouTube, so just remember it. Maybe jump to the explanation part of it, go through it again, and then you can understand what it means. Perfectly fine. You don't have to get everything on the first try. This is a lot of information, I know that. <clears throat> and it's going to be even more information because now we are going to JSON. Back to presentation mode, right? First of all, what is JSON? That is the abbreviation for JavaScript object notation. It was created quite a long while ago as a very simple way of exchanging data. This does not have anything to do with the programming language. There are no commands. There's nothing it can execute. This is simply for storing data in a very simple structure. It's really, really easy and preferably in a human readable format. So when you take a look at a JSON file, you can see actually see the data that is in there. Um, until pretty recently, so version 6.1.0, uh, the, the widget designer project file was still a JSON format, so you can open the file in the text editor, take a look at it, and you can actually read it and read the values in there, which is really handy. Since 6.1.1, that has changed into a binary format, unfortunately, for that purpose. Okay, what do I need to pay attention to when I'm using JSON? First of all, it consists of key and value pairs separated by a colon, so you always have one key, and one value. That's pretty straightforward. You can have as many of those pairs as you want to. You can just separate them by a comma. So I have my pair number one, comma, pair number two, comma, and so on. <clears throat> you have to pay attention to enclose your JSON object in curly brackets. So the nice ones. And when you are using any kind of string, the keys are strings, so characters, and of course there is the possibility to use strings in your JSON, you have to use double quotation marks. You might remember that widget provides you with the possibility to choose between the single and the double quotation marks. In JSON it has to be the double. Anything else does not work. Okay, what do we have for data types? Of course, JSON has data types like Widget Designer too, but you won't find that too hard to. Because we have numbers, which is either a decimal or an integer, doesn't matter which one. You have a string, so any kind of character. You have Boolean, which is also the keyword true or false. You can have an array. Now, this time it's called array. But it's the exact same thing as a widget designer list. You can put any kind of other type in it, in any number that you want. And the one thing you don't know yet is called a map. 
So it's a nested JSON object. You can put even more JSON objects within one JSON, which is something you're going to do later in the example project. <clears throat> okay, let's take a look at an example. What does it look like? Something like this. So what we have here is a data set about a company called Christie, enclosed by the curly brackets. You can see that here. And all the keys I have tinted in green and all the values are tinted in red. So my key is called company. That's Christie. That's a string. The year founded is 1929, obviously a numeric value. Does it have over 1000 employees? Yes, we do. That's true. And what we have over here is a nested JSON. So products is a map and it contains three different types of, well, products. Mm. That's easy doing, right? So how do we use that in Widget Designer? Let's take a look at Widget Designer. Go back to the previous page. And I have prepared a little JSON, <clears throat> as you can see here. So I have a little data set of someone called Jonathan, age 27, coming from the UK. And he speaks English uh, fluently, a little French, mm, Spanish pretty well, and in a list, some other languages, just a bit. <clears throat> what I did here is I used a string right that over here that is a string and i'm converting it to a json with a to json member so that my participant variable over here is of json type and not string as you can also see i have used the single quotation marks for declaring the string over here because the double ones i have used in the json okay now what can i do with that first of all how do i retrieve information from that very easy. We have a couple of members for that. There is a few get members and all of them have a data type. So you have a get string. This is going to return you a string type. The get double will of course return you a double type and the list can return you a list type. The single get is going to return another JSON. If you are not sure what's going to happen, take a look at your uh, script assist. It tells you what exactly it's returning. So the string returns a string. And of course, I forgot to enlarge the script. Sorry about that. So what we're trying now is get string. And now you need to pay attention. The normal bracket does not open automatically because it is optional. So if you say get string, it's just going to return you the complete thing as a string. Let's check that. There we go. That's a string. If I want to address a single element of that, I can open the bracket and you can see it wants the location as input parameter. The location is more or less the key or keys put together. We get to that. So if I want to see, for example, the name, I'm just entering the key name and it will return the name, Jonathan. Perfect, that's what I wanted. Okay. <clears throat> Now, let's say I want to retrieve the information that's inside here. So the languages. Well, I should have selected a shorter word. Okay. Now I got everything that's in this little JSON object over here. All of the languages. But maybe I only want to know what his French capabilities are. So what I do and this is where you need to pay attention to the name of JSON. It is an object thingy. So what do we associate with object and especially object and member notation? Right, the dots. So I place a dot and continue with a further location, like French. And pay attention to how you are writing things because this is case sensitive. So my French has to start with a capital letter over here. Let's check that one out. Basic, exactly. That's the French capability. Perfect. <clears throat> okay, let's go one step further. As you can see, the other 
thingy is an array. So there's two different values in it. I know he can speak a little Russian and German also pretty well. That's great. How do I address that? First, I'm entering the name, of course, the key. How do I address the first of that one? By using the index, of course, like we're always addressing arrays and lists. You're using the index just this time with another dot and not in the bracket. So keep in mind, JSON uses the dot. Let's test that one. Russian little. Exactly, that's what I wanted to have. Okay, next step. How am I going to set something in there? I usually don't want to retrieve only, or only retrieve the values. I also want to change the values. So let's say Jonathan is not happy with his nationality being described as UK. He wants to be British. <clears throat> so we are using participant and we are going to use the set member. So set can do two different things. It can either update an existing value or it can create a new one. First of all, we're updating existing things. So you see again, Scriptasis tells you, hmm, I want the location. Location is nationality. I really should have taken shorter words. And now the value, which is going to be British now. Okay, that looks better. And let's also check if that worked. Ooh, okay. So apparently it has worked, but uh, that, that doesn't look very nice, right? Compared to this view over here. That is because JSON is usually not formatted. <clears throat> So all those nice little tabs and line breaks and all that, that is just for the human readable factor. So it's easier for us to read it and see it. But of course, there's a nice little uh, member for that. It is called too pretty string because the pretty string is much prettier. There's that. And there you go. Now you got your nice format and you can read it. And we can also see Nationality change to British. Perfect. <clears throat> okay. How are we going to change um, maybe the other language? Um, French. Maybe maybe he's not able to do basic French. Maybe he doesn't know French at all. So let's start with the same thing. Set um languages and again we are going to address one element within the languages map so we take the dot for addressing that and french value none and check that out of course, you have to write it correctly. I'm sorry for all the French people watching. There we go. French none. Perfect. So with uh, the dots, you can address the nested elements. So you can have even five nested um, JSON objects or lists in it. You always address it by one dot after each other. That is really not complicated once you have a system. And this is also something you should keep attention to when you are writing your own JSONs. Keep it simple and structured so that it's easy to understand and easy to program. Hopefully when you're working with a JSON someone else has programmed, that person did the same thing. Okay. How about we're going to add something? So what we did now, we did change existing parts. Okay, let's say I'm going to add, well, let's say just a test key and it's going to be one, two, three. Let's see what happens. And it adds the test over here. Perfect. But maybe I don't want the test here. I want the test to be part of the languages. Okay, that's easy. 
and again just use the dot as a connector between different stages. Let's see that. And the test wandered over here. <clears throat> Great. And maybe we want to finish this. <laughs> okay. Now you have an idea of how to deal with JSONs. Use the get member to retrieve any kind of value and use the set member to set any kind of value. Either update existing ones or create new ones. And use the dot to connect different stages of nested things. Either arrays uh, or maps. Uh, Janina, we've got a question. Yes. Um, how, how do you take a JSON uh, object like this and export it outside of the widget? Oh, there is actually a, a member, for example, for, wait, participant one, dot, to file, for example. Here you can enter a file path, and then it's going to write all the information that's in there into a certain file. You can, of course, if you have devices connected, if you need that, um, send that also as TCP messages or UDP or Siri or whatever you need, or even via HTML. Did that answer the question? Yes, it did. Uh, and they're also asking how to read it from a file. If you were to save it from one widget and open it in another, how would you read it from that file? Uh, mm -hmm, that's a good one. Um... Let me check. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. Okay, um, I would have to think about it, how to do it via scripting. In principle, you could do it with um, <clears throat> with a text reader node, for example, and direct that to a string variable. And then, well, you can just convert the string variable to a JSON. Um, I will try to think of something after we are, we are finished, and um, we can answer that again later. Anything else? That's all. Thanks, Perfect. Okay, perfect. Cool. Then we can go and take a look at our little example project. Okay, so I have something prepared over here, which is a list view. Um, I'm going to load data from an Excel sheet into my list view, and then I'm going to read the data, put it in a JSON, and I'm going to be able to retrieve the values that we have in there. Okay. <clears throat> And we are going to play a little game as well, because let me first select my file, apply, OK. What I have here is a table full of uh, famous film characters and uh, famous quotes of those characters. And uh, if you feel like you have too much time and you're a fan of movies, you can try to find out all the movies that those uh, quotes relate to, send uh, the list of the movies to our support address, and the first person who sends the complete correct list of those quotes is going to receive a nice little postcard from Cologne. Handwritten by me, of course. Okay, so first we want to have the names of all those film characters in a list. I have prepared a little script for that, which is set names. And I have also prepared a variable called names. Names is going to be a list, and we are going to fill all the names of those characters into a list. So we have element number one is Galadriel, the next one C3PO, the next one Ford, the Black Knight, and so on. <clears throat> How are we going to achieve that? Okay, assuming that maybe we have performed that a couple of times and that our list is being updated, it is always a good idea to reset our names list first, which we can do with 
this. So my global variable now, no matter what's in there, whenever the script is called, is going to be reset to nothing. <clears throat> and what we're also going to do is we are assuming that this list does not have a fixed length or maybe a maximum of 20. Well, 20 is definitely sufficient. Um, <clears throat> so we're going through all those elements with a for loop for i equals 1, 2, 20. If you are interested in how the for loop works, or if you haven't seen it, Justin did a training on that last week. It is on our YouTube page. Using that one. And what I'm going to do is I am appending what I'm reading to my names. So now I need the value. What is it going to be? It is going to be my list view cell. So I start typing list view, number one, um, get cell. This one well delivers me the specified cell. And this is going to be first the column and then the row, I hope. Uh, so column is always number one. And row is going to be my I. There we go. Okay, let's test that. And someone forgot a bracket. Let's check if that worked. Okay, that looks fine. So all the names are in there, but you can see in, in the tooltip that there's a couple of empty elements in that list being all those empty cells. Maybe I don't care but maybe I don't want to have them in my list, so I can add a little helper script. There is a possibility to break a for loop. So when you are going, for example, from 1 to 100, and at one point you don't want to execute it anymore because maybe you met a condition, <clears throat> you can use the, uh, the keyword break to break it. So. What I want to do now is I want to check if my cell over here is empty. And when it's empty, the end of my list is, around, is there and I want to well, stop my for loop. So what I'm doing is for, no, sorry, if. And now I take this one over here. <clears throat> so if the cell I am currently looking at. And now we have a very cool little string member and it is con called is empty. This one returns me a Boolean values for true or a false if it is empty or not. That one is empty. So as soon as I reach my number 12, it's going to tell me, no, this one is empty and I can add a condition that is supposed to be executed. And this is going to be my break. <clears throat> Let me show that to you by entering a debug message. Let's say just the index over here and And break over here. Let's check that out. Okay, so those are running normally. And here we are running into the condition and we are breaking and nothing else is executed. Perfect, that's what we wanted. <clears throat> In our list, we can see, check out the tooltip. Perfect, it stops after body. That's what we wanted. Great. And that's all we need to do in our set names macro. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, okay, what do I want to do now? I want to have one big JSON where I can store this whole information in it. So I have 11 little data sets, one for each person. 
that contains information about origin, profession, and well, the quote, of course, which is important. I have, for that purpose, created a global JSON, which is <clears throat> empty so far. And now I'm going to create another little script for filling that JSON. <clears throat> How am I going to do that? Again, I'm just going to reset the original one by using this syntax. <clears throat> so unfortunately, we are already used to Widget Designer recognizing automatically what our data type is, like automatically recognizing an integer or a string. This does not happen with JSON, so you have to first start as a string and then force it to be a JSON. Keep that in mind. And what I'm also going to add is a <clears throat> local variable called current data set equals well, the same. It's also an empty JSON. <clears throat> what am I going to need that for? I am going to first fill my little current data set with the information for one person add that to my complete data set, and then proceed to the next one. Again, doing that with a for loop. <clears throat> Great, and now comes in handy what you have learned before. I'm starting with a zero because I am now going over my list. <clears throat> you see that? My little names list. Start with index zero. And now I can use the trick I have learned before. Uh, names was it, sorry. Names dot count. And don't forget the minus one because we are starting with zero and not with one. Okay. <clears throat> so first thing I want to do is I'm going to set my empty current data set to dot set and I'm going to add the origin. <clears throat> okay. The origin is going to be the same thing we had before list view one dot get cell number two and here I can also use my iteration variable i as we used it before just as a little different because again we are starting with zero over here but my first list element is a one that happens all the time in Widget Designer and all the other programming languages. So keep in mind whether you have an index or whether it starts with one or something, because you might have to add or subtract something from it. <clears throat> okay, so that one is going to set the origin. And now we can just go and copy paste that. We have one for profession. And we have one for the quote. And of course, adjust the columns two and four. So we have column number two, origin, profession, and the quote one, two, three, and four. Okay. That is now collecting all the data we have in one of those rows into my current data set. And what I'm going to do now is adding that to my whole data set. So my data dot set. And now I can just add a complete new location, which is going to be the name. So names. Hmm. And the index. So my first item is going to be Galadriel. 
number one. My second one, C3PO, and my number nine is going to be Roy. Names. And now we are adding, adding the current data set. Okay, so this is going to take data set number one, collect all the information, put all the information together in my whole data set. Next loop, it's going to take the next line, collect all the data, write it in my big data set, and so on until all the data sets are full. And let's check that in the debug message with data. <clears throat> Too pretty string. Test that. Okay, that does look pretty nice. So I can see this is one of our data sets. This is Jules. <clears throat> we have his origin, his profession, and a quote. Perfect. We have the Black Knight. We have an origin, profession, and a quote. Okay, let's check if they are all correct. Rock and roll, right? Ooh, that's interesting. Take a look at this. This is the first item in the list. And this is the first item in my list view. This is not the same. If you recognize it, that's what the last item says. And this is why we went through all that hassle before to learn about the reference types, because this is exactly why that happens. We are first initializing our current data set and the first part of the new data set, which is Galadriel. But it's a reference. So for each loop in our for loop, my first element, Galadriel, will always be referred to whatever we are changing right now. This is where I need my copy member and it it might not always be um, as obvious what's happening if you're working with lists and with jasons and you encounter strange things things that, things that you do not expect and can't really explain think about if it might be fixed with a copy member let's try that again test and now perfect this is what we wanted to have this is where we need the copy member. Great. <clears throat> and what we're going to do now, I have this little drop down list over here prepared where we are going to fill in all the names so we can display the information here. So that's going to be drop down list one dot, what was it? Set, set items from array. That's good. And this is going to be names, test. And now my dropdown contains all the names. Great. And the very last thing, and also really easy to do, is I am adding a action script node, scripts action. So every time I change my dropdown list, it's going to fill in the values over here. I am selecting the drop down list text. I'm adding it. And I'm going to use my label texts. So label one dot text equals. <clears throat> and now I can use my data variable and get a string from there, which is going to be um, <clears throat> my value. Keep in mind when you're using the action script node and you have any kind of trigger over here, you can use this trigger as a local variable called value. I can, of course, just take this one and enter it here. This means the exact same thing, but value is shorter. And in case you have several triggers, it's also easier. <clears throat> so this is going to give me the name, which is at the same time the identifier of my object in my JSON. And I need to add that. 
class origin. So that's the first one. Again, what I'm doing, I am using my JSON data. I am retrieving a string, which is for my first item, Galadriel or maybe Bodhi. And then I'm adding dot origin. So <clears throat> the complete string here would be, for example, Galadriel dot origin. And it is supposed to display me Lothlorien. Let's see if that's working. Apply. Yep, perfect. That's what I want. So now I can take that one and just copy paste it two times and replace the correct things over here. Label three, label two. Profession and boat. Apply. There we are. It is working fine. And in the name of the moon, I will punish you if you did not pay attention. Okay, so there you are. You got a complete example of how to set a couple of data sets. You can retrieve the values not only from an Excel sheet, but from any source you can imagine. How you are managing that, how you are setting and retrieving values. And yeah, that's it. We're going to have um, another training or webinar about how to professionally do data management because it becomes more and more important for all kinds of applications to be able to manage data. I have already seen a couple of customer projects with an enormous amount of JSON data. It's like a huge JSON file and you are needing information from that. For example, for displaying soccer um, or football results from games. That was one of the applications I have seen. And yep, you should be prepared to see that. So I am at the end of what I wanted to tell you. Justin, are there any more questions we should answer now? Uh, no, there's not. Okay, perfect. Then we're going to stay online for a little more. So if you come up with any other question, just go and ask us. Otherwise, take a look at our um, schedule for the webinars on our website or on Facebook. If you have any more ideas, go to our forum and post an idea there. Of course, always consult your manual. It's a good manual. And if you're interested in more of the webinars, this one is also going to be hosted there. You go go to our YouTube YouTube channel. Um, yep, that's it so far. Thank you for watching. Thank you for bearing it for well one hour and fifteen minutes. I know that's been a lot. And um, yeah, have a nice day. Enjoy the other webinars. <laughs>